They sent me to the federal penitentiary, the ADX Supermax in Colorado. This place is reserved for the worst of the worst. Your international terrorists, super spies, cult leaders, cartel bosses. I've been in and out of prisons most of my life. When I arrived at the gates of the Supermax, I knew I was at the gates of hell. Some of the toughest guys I've ever seen go into psychiatric breaks. I can still hear their screams. You want to break a man's spirit? Take everything away from them and leave them alone forever. This place pushed me to the edge of insanity. But then I found a nurse, a chess game, a new friend, and a warden. A warden with humane compassion in the most isolated place on earth. Warden Robert Hood. But today, I call him strictly by his first name, Bob. Now we stand side by side to speak out about the evils of this place and what it does to a human being. Welcome to this very special episode of Table in the Back. Welcome to Table in the Back. I'm Sammy the Bull. I got a very special guest here today. I'm excited. Bob Hood, warden of the ADX. I'm really excited to do this interview. It's about prison reform. It brings me back in time and history. And uh, I'm super excited. Let's get on with it. And this is Bob Hood, warden of the ADX. Thanks for letting me be here, Sammy. My pleasure. My pleasure. I'm dedicated now to a lot of things, prison reform, uh, drugs that are pouring into the country and the country, but this is basically about prison reform. And I thought there would be no better person to talk about it than you. You've dealt with some of the biggest and most notorious prisoners on the planet, terrorists and everybody else. So I, you know, you could explain that better than me. And uh, so there's a lot of topics we're going to cover, a lot of area. I think first of all, for me, it's realizing that we're more similar than I thought. Um, we come from a different world. We've had different uh, upbringing, different career paths and everything else. But in the end of the time period of thinking about this, we're very similar. Uh, I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. You were the enemy across the bridge. Right. As you were from New York, you know, we just thought differently in that way. Right. But we still have a lot of similarities. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you know Elizabeth, New Jersey, and Brooklyn, uh, New York. Yeah, we're on two different sides. But, um, you know, prison reform is about compassion. And um, I'm, I'm the bad guy and you're the good guy. <laughs> and we're sitting down, and uh, we went. Uh, I, I it was horrible in school. I was dyslexic, and I, school was a disaster for me. Mm -hmm. But I had good parents, just like you had. And uh, the similarities, I think, grew in different ways, and we just came together. You know, and I remember how compassionate you were as a warden in the ADX. When I walked into the ADX in the it was so overwhelming, even for me as a tough guy, in and out of different jails. Mm -hmm. When I heard that big gate, it was 10 feet high or whatever it was, slammed shut behind me. And I walked in down that ramp. Um, I said, wow, this is hell. I'm in hell. I know, I know that, and it's going to be a nightmare. I, I knew that as I was walking in. I had leg chains, belly chain, hobbling down, guards around me with batons in their hand. I said, this is real prison. This is going to be ferocious. And, uh, but I got in and I knew I was going to have to just toughen up and be whatever I say I am. Mm -hmm. And I found that you had a lot, a lot of compassion. Thank you. Okay. The prison was immaculate and was tough, no question about it. But I got to realize that you did your job as a warden that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but there were so many compassionate things. There was no bullying. I, now, I met a few guards who I didn't get along with. 
and I think that's normal in every form of life. Sure. We had mafia guys who were horrible and mafia guys who were decent. Now, we did things in our life. Part of our life was being, I believe it's almost like being in the military. We took orders and we followed those orders, whether it was killing people or whatever, and it was never innocent people or women or children. It was within our ranks. We had rules. We had to abide by them. If we didn't, we died by them. We took that oath and we understood that. You took an oath to the government and as being a warden to run the place, whether you like it or not. You did that, but you did that with compassion. And uh, there's many, many times I saw you, but I didn't have to see you. I understood and saw your policies. In 2004, they stopped people from smoking. And you had sent something around and said, it's a new law and I have to abide by it. In commissary, buy as many cigarettes as you want. Nobody's gonna take them from you, but we'll stop selling them. And uh, I didn't wanna stop smoking, but hearing that it was a compassionate, you were stuck with a, with a, with a position. Sure. But you gave us some slack. You didn't just come in and bum rush us with a bunch of guards or pull us out and search us out, take everything away. You didn't do those things. And I was used to that in certain prisons. Mm -hmm. And uh, you weren't that man. And I respected you. I appreciate that. Um, I didn't try to brown nose you. I did my time like a man. I think I even joked one day when you came by my cell with a bunch of heavyweights. I, I think I'd rather you tell that story. Sure, I'd be glad to. Yeah. Well, first on the smoking. You don't mind me smoking now, do you? Eh, no, it's disrespectful, but go ahead. All right. But uh, I'll, I'll be, it's my, I'll be more so I'll smoke. It's your house. <laughs> on, on the smoking thing first. Yeah, um, we had half the inmates in the system actually filing lawsuits because of secondary smoke. We have other inmates saying, hey, I'm doing triple life and you're gonna bust my chops on smoking. So it's kind of a weird thing from a warden perspective. And I'm not a smoker, but I follow orders when they're not um, illegal. But I think the main thing is when we said, this is the drop dead date, you have to stop smoking on this day. We had one inmate, which I'll tell you briefly about, I won't say his name because he's still there and I want to respect his privacy on this. He couldn't handle it. He said, hey, I'm doing life sentence basically. Uh, you're telling me I can't smoke. So we had a nice conversation. What he did after the smoking ban ended and he still used up his cigarettes, he took a plastic bottle of uh, shampoo or something that we authorized and he crushed it up and made splinters. And over one weekend when I was not at the prison, he took one of the splinters, like an eight inch, nine inch splinter, and stuck it into his penis. Oh my God. Because we stopped the smoking. That's how powerful isolation is when you're saying we're not gonna let you do something that you've been doing for 50 years, we're gonna take that away from you. I'm gonna follow the rules. I might even disagree with it. I'm gonna follow the rules. He apologized to me like a man and said, hey, sorry about that. I, I created some issues when I was uh, taken out with, I can't tell you how many staff, but a lot of staff to transport him to the local hospital. But he said I'd do it again. Because if I'm at the supermax, doing the rest of my life, 23 hours a day in the cell, that pain gave me freedom of seeing staff, the, the Rocky Mountains, things I can't get inside. Um, but your comments about the, uh, the, the special visitors, we've had unbelievable people from around the world come to the Supermax. And one I recall during our time there was the uh, FBI director, Mr. Mueller, Robert right. Mueller. Right. An entourage came through, they spent several hours with us. And uh, almost to the end of the tour, we came onto your range where you lived and I just, you know, looked down there and said, here's the type of people on there. I didn't go down there because we've already met most of the inmates. And all of a sudden I can hear this kicking at the door, some kind of noise that uh, an officer told me that somebody wants to see you. Well, normally we walk away. Normally we say, you know, screw that guy, let him make noise. And we try to hide it because it's, it's the FBI director, try to go to another part of the prison. In this case, I said, who is it? He said, it's Sammy the Ball. And he whispered to me, the captain did. So I said, okay, I'm not, I know you're not going to be one of my problem child, children. So we walked down there, 
electronically, gate opens, door opens, I'm looking through you, through the bars at you. The FBI director's behind me, his entourage of FBI agents are all staring at you. And Sammy, to this day, I think it's funny. It, you know, it was one of those deals where I'm trying to do a serious tour. You're doing what makes stress go away in a prison. You're trying to give a little humor here. You say, Warden, I got to talk to you. Now, this is an important day. I got great news. And I'm thinking you're going to be released or you got some really great news. I said, Sam, uh, Gravano, I think I was pissed looking at you like, come on, uh, you know, I got these people here, but what do you want? What's the good news? Tell me. He goes, well, I'm so excited. I got a discount on my Geico rates. And during that time, <laughs> Geico advertisements were on TV every day. Right. So it was, you know, <laughs> the guys put their hand over their face. They walked away. They didn't laugh in front of you. They just, they, you know, whatever. And then later on, the FBI director says, how do you, how do you work around guys like this? Meaning the humor. And I said, that's what keeps us human. We joke when it's time to cry sometimes, or we joke when it's serious. I said, I wouldn't want to be Sammy or some of these guys here, 23 hours a day in a box. And so we had a neat conversation. Yeah, that was crazy. Yeah, I, I watched it on commercials, and I don't know how that came to my head. <laughs> I see all these guys, heavyweights, and uh, I saved a ton of money by switching to Geico. To Geico, yeah. Yeah, and uh, on my car insurance, here I am probably doing life in prison. I'll never Almost see a fucking insurance. car, <laughs> and I'm talking about my car insurance. They should have used that for an advertisement. I know, Geico should have sent me some money for that. <laughs> But that was great. I mean, so I mean, we, you know, it was it was a form of how you respected and I respected. You know, I didn't want to come up here. You had a bunch of people. You were a warden. I wanted to show respect, but be a little, you know, a tell a joke, and it was good. And, and it was good for you and for me. And it was it, it just felt good to go for a little bit. I'd like to talk to you about some of the people who were there. I was there with some of the people that you know and you talk about, but I would, I'm would i sure the audience would love to hear the, about the guys, the Unabomber sure. and all sure. of those guys. So if you could explain to me and my audience about the people and what they did. Sure. I know it was the Un Unabomber, you were talking to him and you tried to make sense to him about when he was running around the yard. I, I, I was up in the tier at one point and I used to look down at him and he would come out and just run around in circles for like an hour straight. I said, what is this guy? I mean, he was a genius, right? I think he had 167 yeah. IQ or something like that. He was a genius. And he, and he was sending bombs. So you explain better to me because he was one of the inmates there and, and whoever you had there. Sure. Well, you know, when you think about it, with 160,000 inmates, federal inmates that exist in 122 prisons, the ones that come to the Supermax are all, it's like a, uh, the wax museum, if you will. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, everyone's special. Most of the people are special there in what they did. They're there for a reason. There's only 326 guys there today. So it's pulling the, the, the worst of the worst, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And when you think about it, the Unabomber, each person, this guy's, uh, he knows six or seven languages. He's uh, uh, a decorated professional, you know, professor from Berkeley, I believe it was. So, you know, you have people like that, but I try to figure out what's the human part of them. What, what, I understand he's educated. I understand he's a hermit. I understand he's, he's going to live in the box for the rest of his life. He's going to die in prison. I get that. But what I don't understand is his relationship with his family. What does he think about his brother who gave him up, if you will? Yeah. And, and so I try to think of that. So when I see that he's running, and I'm a, at the time I was a marathon runner. I was running these 26-mile races. That became the scenario. So I, I try to humanize that. If it's someone like uh, Ramsey Youssef, another high-profile inmate there, we don't have much in common. He tried, you know, he, he back in the 90s, late uh, mid 90s, trying to blow up the world or did blow up the uh, first world center. Um, yeah, that concerns me, of course. But my job is to keep him alive, believe it or not, just to keep him alive, work within the policy and whatever. So I don't understand it. I don't condone it, but I try to figure out what's what's similar. So I might read part of the Quran to try to figure him out. So each person I look for, not a weakness, I look for the, the similarities, like you and I have more similarities than we ever knew. Right. So to look at the Unabomber, the Shoe Bomber, El Chapo was there, the Marathon Bomber, uh, um, a guy by the name of Swango, um, a decorated doctor who's uh, known a convicted serial killer, killed dozens of people as a doctor. 
and he's sitting there. Wow. You sit there and you say, well, as I'm looking through the bars at a guy like that, and I'm saying, okay, he's a doctor, he's more educated than I am in that relationship uh, or profession. Um, he's a military man, he was in the military, he's a family man, and all of a sudden he's doing whatever. What I've learned to do is take off a different hat. Bob Hood, who might despise what he did, when I walk in the door, now I'm a warden. I'm not Bob Hood, the guy on the street. And I might not care for the guy. I might not care, you know, I wouldn't lose sleep if he died today. But as the warden is a whole different story. So I found myself working with each person, and it's almost the teacher in me. I, I have a master's degree in education, believe it or not, and criminal justice, graduate level criminal justice background. But the guy with the teaching part of it, what teachers know about is called an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan, where you look at the strengths of a person and the, or a child, and you look at the weakness, and we all have it. Yeah, absolutely. So I sit there and I say, okay, this guy, uh, you know, this doctor, you know, what's the strength and what are the weaknesses? And I try to not capitalize, go after him on the weaknesses. I try to do that. Right. And for me to say, hey, by the way, uh, Unabomber, you know, or whoever, Ted, Ted, Ted Kaczynski, um, you run and I run. That might seem like a minor thing to your audience, but when you're connecting to a guy doing triple life or it's multiple life, yeah. there's a connection. And I want to go back, and I'll, I'll back off so you can do more talking, but you talk about my compassion, and I don't know where you get yours from because you know, people might not think you have compassion if they look at the crime, but we're not talking about history. We're not talking about, we're talking about now. That's why we're together. When I go back in time, back to Elizabeth, I came from a dysfunctional family. You had a better family than I had. I'll give you that. So if I look at your pre-sentence report and many inmates' pre-sentence reports, and I look at my own personal background, hey, I had worse time than you, some people I know. Right. So I had a dysfunctional family, alcoholic father, we had a suicide in the family, we had uh, all kinds of issues in my nuclear family. One block away were my grandparents, and that was my moral compass. Not my mother and father like you had. Mine was down the street, the safe place to go. Think about it, what I'm saying. Right, right. I go to my, right, yeah. I go to my grandparents, and you go there as a little kid, and you realize that's bringing out the goodness. And I had in the same block, in the same block, Lafayette Elementary School, and I'm in the plays, I'm playing the drums, I'm doing all this, you know, I'm growing up. I, I yeah. loved it. Yeah. And part of it is the teachers, the grandparents took away. So, you know, you talk about the good and the bad. I think the moral compass and maybe think in one way, not to be the warden, but just as a kid, that I had a choice. I could easily have gone in a d different direction, but I didn't want to let down my grandmother and grandfather. My parents, I could, I could have done it in spite. To you know, stuff. that's great. I had a good grandmother and father. It never left me, even in the mafia. How you feel about something, and that's you as a person, and then how you felt as a warden, and I have that same thing. I have how I feel about a person, but mm -hmm. then I thought as Gozanostra, not a warden, as Gozanostra, as a mafia underboss or a leader in there, mm -hmm. I thought another way. And I had some compassion from my mother and father. So we have those mutual feelings even, but you were different as a warden as your personal feelings. And I was the same thing, I, my personal feelings and my mafia feelings, and you were dedicated to be a warden, and, and what you took an oath to, and I was dedicated to be a mafioso. It's a strange connection, it but it's a connection, and we have the same thoughts. And I have a lot of things when I now when I talk about uh, prison reform. I don't just want to let everybody out. Sure. That's not my thing. Um, I'm deadly against a, a legitimate, a legitimate serial killer who just wants to kill, mm -hmm. I hate them. Mm -hmm. a, a, a rapist, uh, a, ch a child molester. And, uh, but I, I have compassion for people who have killed because they're in the mafia, they're living up to their oath. Mm -hmm. um, so, they, and, I, and I wanna talk about some of those things. Uh, one of them is a guy, I, I think I might as well bring it up right now, is that he's in prison 36, Yes, he was the concierge of the Genovese family, Bobby Manor. 
and uh, he went to prison. He's 36 years in prison. They put him in for compassionate release a couple of times and denied it. He's 94 years old. Hmm. Now, the government has policies and they let people out of prison on a compassionate release. Some people. And some people they don't. I, I can't see doing that, cherry picking who you want to let out and who you want to keep in sure. it. Craig Schapa Jr., they let him out. He's out now. He's still alive. He's a compassionate release. He was a monster compared to this guy, Bobby Manor. So they let him out and not Bobby Manor. Now, 94 years old, mm. you're, you're 70, I'm 78. We know he's not going to crack an egg. He's not going to do anything but go home, love his family, be loved by them, and die with his family. Now, denying that for, for him and doing it for somebody who's really close to being a serial killer, sure. it's insane to me. And uh, so one of his crimes uh, was, I think, a conspiracy to kill uh, Mary Berry Trump, Donald Trump's sister, who's a judge. And they completely flipped out about this. Now, you're a good guy. They're good guys, supposedly. Act like a good guy. Have compassion. Show compassion like you did as a warden. Show what you are as a good guy. Now, I'm a bad guy. I deserve certain things. But I have compassion as well. So if you're not going to have any compassion whatsoever and you're going to want to slowly wait, make this man after that 94, after 36 years to rot in prison, you mm. might be worse than me. You right. might even be worse than a serial killer because mm -hmm. you're going to have no compassion or love in you at all. Let this guy out. Give him a fucking brick. Let him go home with his family. And when you don't do that, you notice as well, we talked about it a little bit, about how much damage you're doing, not only to him, to his families and children and grandchildren and everybody like that. Um, so... You know, and I would like to say, send a message. If Donald Trump, if you listen to this, talk to your sister. Help this guy. Mm -hmm. When it sues you to let somebody out because you're going to get some votes, and I'm not talking about you, Trump, but I'm talking about everybody, every politician. Sure. So you can let somebody out who's a hip hop person and you're getting little votes and you'll get, get, do the right thing. Right. Tell your sister to do the right thing and act like the good guy. Or don't ever call me or any mafioso a bad guy. You're just as bad. We drop bombs all over the world. Mm -hmm. Everybody could kill for what their reason is, for whether it's loyalty mm -hmm. to the government. I was in the military. I was told over and over again to go kill in Vietnam and this and that. I was never shipped to Vietnam. And I believed in it, and I was ready to go kill. But be consistent. If be consistent in what you do right. and what you say. If you're a good guy, be a good guy. He's 94 years old. Mr. Samuel, let me add to that. During my entire career, I'm retired from the Bureau, and I do my things now, but in my entire career, I only know one example of a compassionate release. Since I've been retired and I look back at the Bureau, they've provided many of them because the world has changed. COVID came in. They let a lot of people go because there was sickness going on. So more occurred later. But back to when I was a warden, I was at Fort Worth, Texas, and there was an inmate by the name of Mario Biaggi. And I know him. Well, I don't know him as... I mean, I don't know him personally, yeah, but I know who he is. I didn't know him even then because uh, he's from your way. He's up in Brooklyn area. Yeah. But, you know, back in the time, he ran for mayor of New York. He was a congressman. He was uh, at one time one of the most decorated law enforcement people in the country, known for that in New York City. He was even the, uh, it was instrumental in developing the Federal Law Enforcement Memorial in Washington, D.C., which honors the people that died in law enforcement. So for my, you know, the good guy, as you call me, the good guy side, he's a decorated hero. But then he went on the other side. And through corruption, it wasn't heavy-duty stuff, but it, as far as it was corruption, he was taking bribes and stuff. He goes to federal prison in Fort Worth, Texas. I was there. When we received a call 
from above, and we say above meaning central office, saying you need to release him. I disagreed with that. I said, who? I didn't know who Mario Biazzi was as far as the, the political crap. I just knew him as the president of our walking club. He would go out with inmates early in the morning and walk the yard. And then he, as he got worse and worse, he was in a wheelchair. We had a tennis, nowadays you can't do it because it looks like a country club atmosphere, but they would be in wheelchairs playing tennis. And he would be out there as an old man. And all of a sudden we get this stuff, Mario Biazzi, he needs to be released to New York City on a compassionate release. I had to look it up as a policy, but we never used it. To this day, I don't know anyone personally that has been released. So as a, as a person who follows orders, I disagreed with it, but I said, why would we do this when we have a semi-medical unit here, inmates, mm -hmm. where we have dozens of inmates in wheelchairs, guys who are 60, 70, 80 years of age, some have six months remaining, we're letting out this one guy. So that's where my compassion even would say, yeah, you're right, the guy's an older guy, he's circling the drain, time to go home, let him go, I get that. But when you're running the place and you realize, I'm the one who walks the compound, I go on the same unit that we just left them, let them go home from, and the inmates are wheeling up to me or are walking up to me with months to live, a couple of years to live maybe, and they're saying, we like uh, Mario, but what about me? Right. The fact that I'm a little black guy from New York City right. and I did uh, some drug stuff, I'm dying too, what about me? So what it does in a system that is... Uh, not consistent. Yeah. It's allowing one person to go home, and I'm not trying to put down. He, he's he has four a nice wife, four kids. Uh, he died when he was 97 years of age. He didn't do his whole sentence. He did around 23 months at the prison, instead of a couple years, and he had a, I think a $500,000 fine or something like that. So he went home, and he was honored actually when he got home, and then he dropped dead, you know, because he was sick. I feel bad for his family. People die, but he's 97. Come on, he he he. he he had plenty of time. What about the others? And I think that's where our system is messed up. Yeah. We're not being consistent. Well, he's politically connected. Very much. So that's what did it. Or So you're cherry picking. Me, you want to call me the devil and you want me to rot. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a limit to rotting. Listen, I'm not saying I didn't deserve a lot of time. I'm not saying that uh, the guy I'm talking for... Uh, didn't do a lot of uh, things and deserve some time, but 36 years? Yeah. Where is enough time? In other words, you just want to grind him right to the bottom and, and destroy his family. None of that means nothing to you as a good guy. You would expect that from me, maybe. But even if you're not the good guy, Sammy, you said 36 years. Going back to the Supermax, you can take a guy that the system that I work for, and I, I have loyalty just like you had loyalty to your system. Yes. We have a guy that spent 36 years with basically no human contact. At all. At all. I'm not just saying, wow. I'm not just saying you locked him out and he did a life sentence. That's a whole different story. You're walking the yard at Leavenworth, you're walking the yard at Allenwood or something. I'm saying where someone put the X on and said, because of what you did, horrific stuff, I mean, serious stuff, killed a correctional officer, killed an inmate, you know, tough guy. But then you say, you know what, by law, not because of just some warden wants to do it, you change the rules and you say, guess what, we're not just going to put the X on you, we're going to make it worse than death. Right. Now, that's the system saying, and, and the exact name, I'll tell you, your, your, your viewers can look him up, he just died recently, uh, Silverstein, Tommy Silverstein. I heard him. He, needs to, he, was, he came into prison uh, the end of 2005 at the Supermax right. and died uh, Ill after a while of natural death, 60-something year old. People clapped when he died of natural death. But more importantly, they were bothered in one way because to spend 36 years in the bowels of Leavenworth, a special cage made for him down in the hidden part of the country, or our country or our system, then came to the supermax where you are, and you had a bad, I'm not putting it, you know, taking it away from you, you had a bad 23 hours a day locked down with all the craziness. Take that and double it and say, guess what? Not only, Sammy, are you going to be there, you're not going to see another inmate by law, not the warden. You're not going to hear another inmate. You're going to wreck alone in the cage. The staff are going to hate you because you killed one of their own. So they're going to feed you, but they're looking at you and not going to have normal conversations like right. you're used to. So you, you get those type of things and say, guess what? I agree he should be in prison, 
We put him in a special section of the prison called Range 13. The only person he eventually saw was a guy that was been there since 1994, Ramsey Yusuf, World Trade Bomber. The only two in history that spent time at the supermax in that area. And the reason why I bring that up is when you talk about the compassionate release, I'm all for the 95% of the inmates that go home. That's pretty much the percentage. 95% of all inmates, federal, state, go home. They're going to be your neighbors whether you like them or not. And you're making animals out of them. And what you're doing is, and even if they're not going home, I have, in the last couple of years especially, in retirement, I'm looking at the nine, I'm looking at the five percent too. I made mistakes as well, a lot of mistakes as warden, but part of it was the five percent that aren't going home, because we kind of put an X on them, saying, you know what, it's Sammy the Bull. So there's a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't let him go home. You know, a lot of people say this guy shouldn't go home. Well, the bottom line is, you are home. So if I, it might, not to speak for you, but if I take that reentry package and say. Let's forget about the crimes. Hard to do, but I'm just saying. Take away your history. Take away my history. And now say, what's the probability of Sammy Gravano going back to prison? As your former warden, and now as your friend, because I wouldn't say that when I was there. I wouldn't call you a friend, because we don't do that kind of stuff in prison. Right. But now, as I get to know you more, I would guess, professionally guess, your chances of being a recidivist, which is very high in this country, federal and state, is zero. Now people, I'll get emails as soon as, I, as soon as people look at this, and they'll criticize me for even being here. They'll criticize right. you for me. But the reason why I can say zero, I've met your family. I met your grandkids. That might mean nothing to anyone. Big deal, so you met some family members. If you met my, part of my dysfunctional family, you'd go to prison. You'd rather be in prison. Mm -hmm. But in your case, yeah, you'd be, you'd be a real jerk. To, you know, no disrespect, but you'd be a real jerk to screw up after I saw those two beautiful kids yesterday, or your son got to meet him, and you know he's messed up, he's done some things, but I got to meet your family, and that's what a lot of the 160,000 federal inmates don't have. They're coming out, and by the way, the number last year, federal, just federal, not state and federal, 40,000 people were released last year from the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And if we were able to dissect that, but we don't, how much have a dysfunctional family like Bob Hood? How many have no one there? They don't have the grandkids that you have. 60% uh, of the federal inmates, approximately, are in there for drug-related offenses. But sometimes they're doing some crazy time. What makes me think that you're not coming back? I got to know you more. Hey, what? And I could argue, by the way, and I'm saying this respectfully again. I don't know if you should be out now. I, I uh, you know, I, I would like to jump in, yeah. not to. No, I'm done. But I jumped in because I, I have an answer for that. Yeah. When I cooperated, I know agents, Frank and Matty, who were there for me when I cooperated, George Gabriel, Bruce Mao, and on and on and on. People like you, people like Bob Hood, a warden when I was in the toughest prison in the country. Their love and their compassion makes me do what I'm doing now. Stay straight. Meet with people, you're supposed to be my enemy. Some people look bad mount me about it. Mm -hmm. You're sitting down with the enemy. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm sitting down with people who are people. They don't like what we did. Hmm. We don't like what some of them did. Sure. But without their compassion, maybe I would have recommitted. If I was this guy and I was in that ward that I was no people at all. Range 13. I would have recommitted, I, of course, I, when I came out, I would have been a stone cold animal. You give me, you do that to me, I'm going to live on, I'm going to live for a while, maybe I'll come out, I'm going to live on hate. I hate you, I hate everybody. Mm -hmm. I hate myself. And that's what you're going to let out. Somebody who's capable, I'm a hit guy, somebody who's capable of killing you, and it's full of hate. He's going to do it. Yes. When I got out, it was a couple of times, I was with my daughter and I was going to a store and uh, some guy come running up and I turned around ready. And my daughter said, what are, you, what, what are you doing? I said, I just did 18 years in prison. If somebody runs up on me like that, uh, let me give me time. Yeah. Give me time to breathe. But, and why am I doing 
prison reform. When I got out in 2017, I had $430 in my pocket. The government ripped, I was penniless. Didn't have a car, didn't have anything. I did have family. They bought me jeans, sneakers, socks, underwear, t-shirts. Basic stuff. Basic stuff. My daughter took me around to do certain things. I went for social security, I went for food stamps. I got food stamps one month. They stopped it because uh, I was making more than a thousand dollars a month on my social security, so they stopped the food stamps. I couldn't get medical things. My mm -hmm. daughter said, you were in the army, I'm, let's go to the VA. I went to the VA. And it was tough standing online and humiliating with my daughter taking me around. I lived with my daughter. And uh, it makes me think, what if my ex-wife, my ex-wife was there for me too. What if I didn't have my ex-wife? Sure. What if I didn't have my daughter or my son or my grandchildren? There's some guys in prison I know personally, black, Hispanic, everything, who come out, who don't have that luxury. Mm -hmm. And we're going to say, whoa, they recommitted. They can't get certain jobs. They can't vote. They can't live within the Constitution and have a legitimate gun like everybody else has. You have their back against the wall. Mm -hmm. You get some drug dealers, you talk about who made 10, 20, 30,000 a week, comes out, and now you tell them, be a good boy. Go to McDonald's. Go to McDonald's, yeah. work for $12 an hour, yeah. flip hamburgers. Yeah. And you wonder why he recommits. He has no opportunities. And in certain prisons, as you well know, it sounds good. There's teachers, they could get education, it's all bullshit. You ain't gonna get nothing in prison. You're gonna deal with inmates. You're gonna do inmate yeah. stuff. They can care less about you and your education and everything else. They look at you, or most of them, not all of them, as the enemy. Sure. So they're not taking any good advice, especially when you go into a place with a bad warden or a bad unit manager or a bad guard. I mean, I had a guard throw my mail at me on, through the slot. Sure. And, I, and he dropped the trays. I gave him the trays back. When he pulled it out with one hand, his trays dropped. And he's mounted off. You threw them. I didn't throw them. You dropped them. Sure. sure. And he took the mail. Instead of giving it to me, he threw it right in my face. But every one of those, the, the example that you just gave, even though it seems minor, how someone gives you something, it adds to your potential for coming back. So you, you wonder, why do people come back? It's the isolated example of some idiot throwing the mail or some ward maybe not being the way they should be, whatever. But th think, I mentioned earlier, what, 40,000 federal inmates are coming back. If you take the federal and the state, 600,000 600, people are being released or were released last year. Every year, pretty much 600,000 state and federal. So we need to look at that and say, guess what? What's our game plan? In the Bureau, they claim it's like 43, 45% recidivism rate. They're coming back from the federal. We'll recommit. Recommit. And normally they're talking about within a three-year period. Sometimes they use one year or whatever. But the point is, if you take the national figure, it's like 20% or a little bit higher. It's in the 60s sometimes. So if two-thirds of the inmates, state and federal, are coming back, we're failing. Two-thirds is pretty sorry to have them come back. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, so what do we do? You know, you and I are sitting here trying to figure out from a warden's perspective, former inmate expective, or now a guy on the street, uh, you know, you've been through experience. I think that re-entry starts with the first day of prison. You don't wait till the guy gets out and says, well, what should we do? Here's your $400. Get out of here, Sam. Right. You got locked up. You're doing 20 years or whatever the sentence may be. What's the game plan? And part of it is, and here's the former teacher in me, too. I'd want to know, I'd want to put something out there for you, not to manipulate you, but to say, do you have any kids? Do you have the grandkids? Try to figure out what makes you want to live. Right. And then talk about, okay, in your case, you know, you might not have a, a, a high school diploma or GED or whatever. And you sit there, well, why would you want to have one, you could argue. Well, sometimes it's a matter of saying, okay, what do you want when you get out? And how can we get better? Can we get you the driver's license now? Can we fill out the paperwork? Can you make enough money instead of 12 cents an hour in some of the prisons and think that's your go goodbye money? Here it is. How are you going to do it? So I think when the, you look at the reentry figures, we're failing. 
when you look at the public's reaction to crime in general, I don't think people realize that 95 percent, if, if you don't care if we mess up with the inmates, whether it's them or us, the administration, they're your neighbors. These are people that are coming back to your neighborhood, 95 percent. I'm just suggesting that we take care of that and work on prison reform, but also let's not forget prison reform to me also means you have a guy doing life and he's going to throw feces at you, he's going to see the warden and I'm the bad guy so he's going to curse me out and call me every word in the book. To me the recidivism includes the guy that says, you know what, I did my five years, now I want to go to a lower security prison and I'm going to be more humane. They might not ever get out of prison. That should be part of the rehabilitation process right. because then they can live, not to say a normal life, but they can live a life incarcerated if that's what it's going to be and not be a threat to themselves or other inmates and whatever. I think what we've had is we've had, we all know this, when COVID hit the prison systems, mm. just like the world here, it, the prison's a microcosm of society. So it screwed up all our lives, the whole world. But you bring it down to the prison, when they're just living to have their family members visit, they're just hoping the volunteers come in. And it might be for the wrong reason. It might be a good teacher, some preacher coming in as a volunteer. You know, there's all reasons why people get it. It might be just a good-looking young girl from the college coming in and some guy sitting there thinking, gosh, I'm in prison. Isn't it nice to look at some girl? There's all reasons why you want visitors. COVID comes in, you don't see your family. Nobody. They shut the whole thing it's down? It's shut down. So I'm thinking, okay, no, what we imagine. have done is when the judge sentenced a person to prison, we knew it was going to be for X amount of years. What we're not factoring in is, is it five years for a drug, a drug guy, like 60% of the Bureau of Prison guys? Or is it a little extra? It's the extra that I'm concerned about. You get the five years and that's cool. Everybody agrees. I don't like it, but I'm getting five years. You're the judge. You're the boss. But then I go in. You're going to take my family away for a year or two. You're going to stop the programs coming in. You're going to keep me locked down because you don't want me. And maybe for its good reason, it's COVID. We didn't know what to do. I think that needs to be taken in consideration. And if you're getting back to the compassion stuff, the Bureau did look at that. When I left, the Bureau of Prisons had maybe 230,000 inmates. Today, it's 160. It has dropped royally, royally. Some of it's COVID related. Some of it's earlier releases and good time and all that kind of stuff. But I guess my point is looking at those who are going home, looking at those who will never go home, how can you have a man that I can respect as a warden or as a person and saying, hey, you're doing life for 240 years. What makes you get up in the morning? I, I say it, think that way as a right. warden. But then I realize every time I go by the cell, good morning, warden, I'm working on my GED, I'm doing this. And I ask, out of curiosity, what makes you tick? and they're showing me pictures of their kids. My kid, who's in seventh grade, is now getting smarter than me. I just want to keep up the levels. And it's kind of cool to realize recidivism is, is in transformation is individualized, not just system-wide. If one guy's doing a good job, I could care about the recidivism rates, and you might disagree with this, the public might. I always looked at, hey, if I, anyone in, in the prison that I'm working with is not hurting themselves or others, that's just as good as a guy going home and not getting in trouble. But the recidivism rates were so focused on that. How many are coming back because of the money and the politics and everything else? Sometimes we overdo it. And there's a lot of good things that can occur internally if you never go home. Right. Right. It's, it's really a complicated issue, but the conversations you're having now and people like you to have these kind of conversations that are meaningful that's what prison reform is to me. Mm -hmm. I don't think everybody should go home just because uh, you're a good guy and you should have a good conscience. No, I don't think that way either. I don't sure. think uh, I, I went home a little early. Maybe I should have spent more time in prison. I don't think I needed it, but in some cases you do. So I, but I look at it as that what we become as a nation when we have no compassion we have no love. You may take it out on these people and you may enjoy it and like it and love it and whatever you think about it. But that disease that you just had and you're doing to them, it spreads everywhere. To their families, it spreads all around. Before you know it, it's not, we're not even worried about prisoners. 
what the country becomes is a nest of pe people who hate. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have now. I see it a lot. I mean, I, I see some of the things we're doing. It's not the country's fault. It's politicians and stuff like that. Open borders, drugs coming in, this fentanyl and stuff like that uh, in amazing quantities and not being touched. Don't mm -hmm. close the border. Don't care about closing the border. They're caring about that because they want votes. Sure. And uh, from the last number I heard, I don't know how true it is that we lost in, in a year or maybe a little more than a year, 100,000 deaths from Fent fentanyl. fentanyl. And I think back again when I was in the military during the Vietnam War, I understand we lost 58,000 people. Mm -hmm. men and women in the service in that war. And that was such a huge number. I mean, 58,000 yeah. of our sons and daughters who were killed in a war. And we're not disturbed that we just lost 100,000 people, double that number, with drugs, with fentanyl, fentanyl coming across, and we're not even trying to stop it mm -hmm. because of votes. So people have become wrapped up in their own policies and their own things and they don't care about everybody else so when you don't care about prisons and prison reform and our own people i'll give another example guantanamo bay they opened it up for terrorists terrorists only and we had people there spent the fortune on them hundred million dollars i think they spent on Guant guantanamo or some number like that with only million with only 30-something inmates that are there now. And even as light so prisoners can play in the middle of the night, the new field is in addition to an indoor field, a walking track, an exercise that prisoners already have uh, access to with ocean views. Why do they even want to get out? Let me, let me add to that. Let yeah. me add to that before we go a little further because I know in being in prisons, guys, especially in the ADX Supermac, would have killed to be in that place. They were people who were chopping our heads off, bombing us, doing all kinds of things to us. And what do they get? They get military doctors who take care of them. They get military food, which is much better than prison food. They get a soccer field to play soccer. They could pray four or five times a day. Mm -hmm. All different kinds of benefits. And they're killing us. And we have our own people who are our citizens. They did crimes, but they don't get a fraction of that. And every guy, when we saw reports about stuff like that, whether it was on the news or wherever he heard it, said, oh my God, these guys should be here and Switch. we should be there. Switch them, yeah. Switch us. And you're worried about recidivism. It's, nobody's worried about nothing. You know, it's not nobody. There are good people like yourself sure. and other good people around, like I said about the agents I know. And it's a weird thing. I got to know them in time, in prison, after I flipped and whatever. I'm still friends with them. I'm still friends with all of them. We have a relationship. Happy Merry Christmas. Happy birthday. We send things back and forth. We talk. Um, I talked with uh, George Gabriel, and I mm -hmm. told him I was going to do a, uh, an interview with you. Oh, he loved it. He said, Morton Hood's a great guy. I wish you would have known, Jesse. I mean, I would have been in the interview with you. Sure. I said, are you interested in prison reform? Now, he's a heavyweight FBI, FBI guy. guy. yeah. And he said, absolutely. There's so many things that are wrong. I did an interview with a guy named Michael Vecchione, and uh, we talked about prison reform and stuff like that. And he agrees with it. He's actually helped a black guy who was really getting screwed. And uh, he helped him and we to had a conversation and yeah, to get him out. And he was helping him to try to get him out and stuff like that. So that's what prison reform is to me. The guy we think, he was a prosecutor, he was a head cop, he was a heavyweight. You're a heavyweight in that industry or supposed to be our enemy. They're helping. And that helps everybody. It's not just the one guy who did whatever. 
don't point to him. It's the system. When we have enough good people and bad guys talking about it and thinking about it, um, Candace Owen, I hope she sees this. I think I love her. She's great. She speaks the truth all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would love to, she talks about prison reform occasionally. I hope she, if she sees this, gets in touch with me. Uh, Megan Kelly, I did an interview with her great, once. Yeah. She's a great person, speaks the truth. I wish she would get back in touch with me. Uh, or I'm going to get in touch with her, maybe send a clip to this to her and uh, maybe continue with this prison reform. Uh, there's guys who cooperated and I know them out in the street, a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope they get in touch with me. Michael Franchis, when I did another one with him now, and it's going to come out on my new website. I'm opening up a new website. And we did a, a, a big interview just like we're doing now. And he's into this prison reform and, you know, the society, what's going on. And uh, so there's a lot of people that, you know, I, I, we, I hope we can reach enough people to wake them up to say, what are we really doing? Are we just hate everybody? Yeah. Politicians have us arguing with... Uh, Everything is racist, black against white. Years ago, I heard a lot about it when I was in the army and I did time in the South. Mm -hmm. I had a prison, you know, I, I mean, I was friends with thousands of black people. I met their families on, on uh, visits and mm -hmm. stuff like that. All this prison, all this racist shit is bullshit. And I, Kansas always talks about that too. Mm -hmm. You know, they keep us arguing. We say the M word, oh my God, is an explosion. When we were kids growing up, you used sort of, you know, terms and, yeah, I'd be too. And somebody was Irish, they were a Mick. Somebody was Spanish, they were a Spick. And I was a grease ball. And it, it wasn't even, it was meaningless. You're joking mostly. Some, yeah. Most of the times it was a, in a joke or some stupid whatever way. Now, all of a sudden, you lose your job. Every, <laughs> lose your job, lose your future. I mean, all kinds of things can happen. I don't have that hate in me. I could hate you if you do something. I could dislike you if you do sure. something. I mean, but um, I don't just generally hate somebody because they have a different religion or a different nationality or a different whatever. But Sammy, taking that your comment there, it's almost like if you're looking at reentry and we really had a, a committee of people or a group of people, like you're saying some heavyweights to sit down and say, guess what? What, stop, what would stop so many people from coming back to prison? It's almost dissecting or doing a, a surgery, if you will, on the system, right. right from the worst scenario to some minor you know, guy doing a camper, you know, a three-year three, three year stint. Uh, it might be a lot easier than a guy sitting at the Supermax, but it's almost like from a lack of consistency that we talked about, <laughs> let somebody look at the, the <laughs> compassionate releases I don't know what the number is, but that's what a committee can sit down there and say, guess what? How many compassionate releases do we have now versus five years ago? And, and what's our national policy? Do we want to continue that or not? So it's almost, in, me, in my opinion, if you look at the universe of why people are coming back, someone should be reaching out. I'm doing this right now. Someone asked me, why are you doing this with Sammy? Well, I'm into re-entry. I'm into, you know, uh, I'm a program-oriented guy. I'm just curious to see, even if it's isolated cases, where are people today? How did they navigate through the system and have reasons not to come back to that system? It's not a deterrent. If anyone thinks prison's a deterrent nowadays, maybe when I was growing up, people, my parents said to me as we go, and you know the area, we'd get our car inspected over in Rawway. And so we sit there in the line, no air conditioning in the car, and the, uh, my mother would yell at the kids in the back saying, quiet, you know, we're screaming the kids and everything else, while we're standing in line for two hours to get your car inspected in Rollway. And when we were really noisy, she'd point to the dome of Rollway State Prison and say, if you kids don't shut up, you're going to be going to Rollway. That was a deterrent as a kid. Right. Nowadays, no disrespect to the kids in the schools, but all the stuff going on in the world. It's crazy. And then you say, by the way, oh, you might go to prison or some uh, a couple thousand homeless people sitting in downtown uh, San Francisco, oh gosh, if you steal something or if you do something wrong, you can go to local jail. That's a free meal. I mean, it's, it's not a deterrent that you're going to be locked up for a couple of days or a couple of years even nowadays. Right. But I think the difference for me, and that's why I'm here talking to you, you're one of the few people 
that ever have been able to get out of the supermax. And you didn't break out. You, you, you got out legally. Mm -hmm. Legally, not illegally. Um, so when I think of the worst scenario to the least heavy-duty scenario of a camper or something like that, I'm even looking at a guy that most people hate. Most people would hate a guy that blew up the World Trade Center. Right. I don't like what he did, and you don't like what he did. No. We, we go, and if he died today, I wouldn't lose sleep, to be honest with you. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, I'm, my heart's not out to him. However, when you're sentenced to a, a prison at a camp, you're sentenced to a supermax, whatever, should anyone in the United States of America be given a legal policy or order that says you can never see another human being be on staff? You can only get a 30-day-old newspaper. The USA Today is what we used. 30 days old, because we don't want you to have it. All the other inmates, Sammy over here, did some ter terrible things. You, know, you went to prison for it. Mm -hmm. You can get a TV there. But if you get this special X factor, it's beyond death, in my opinion. It's the X factor that says you can never see another inmate. You can only read that newspaper, 30-day-old, and your TV set is not going to have USA Today or the uh, CNN or whatever, no contemporary news. You're going to have movies and junk on it. What we have done is we've taken the rule of law. The judge just says, I'm going to send you away for life or triple life. But if we really don't like you, we're going to add an X factor. It's life plus screw you. It's a headshot. And what we're doing is we're killing you softly, legally. Because right. right. we're going to take away everything that should mean to you. No family visits. And I'm not a... Uh, advocate of El Chapo, he's sitting there right now at the prison, and he's not walking around playing basketball like people's. He's not digging tunnels, getting out. He's not going anywhere. No. We have 12 gun towers on the complex. Right, right. 12 of them. And we have a guy in there who thinks he might be digging out. I'm convinced that there's people in Colorado that know him and have moved there, and they're hoping to maybe try to get him out, and they'll probably... There are probably things in action that uh, he has the money and the means to attempt that. Attempt it. However, as we speak now, he should be in prison. You know, I think he'll agree. He should be where he is now. Mm -hmm. His wife's in prison for three years. His kids are going to go to prison for fentanyl. They're going to do time. But even in the worst scenario, guys that I don't understand their world, do we add the secret sauce to it, to this formula, and say, guess what? If you're talking about reentry, even the worst case scenario, you shouldn't say, Bafungu, <laughs> we're going to go and put the X factor. We're not just going to give you the life. We're going to make your life so miserable. You. We're going to torture. And we're not going to call it torture. You're right, of we're course. We're going to say it's illegal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say, if a guy did something bad enough and you hate him that much or whatever, then have enough balls to kill him. Put him to execute, death. Execute. I believe in the death penalty. Put him to death. Get rid of him. Roy DeMeo became a serial killer. We don't allow serial killers in the mafia. You can't do some really disgusting shit. We kill each other because there's rules. It's a military thing um, that we live by a code. Different than the military. Now, I'm not saying our military, the United States government military, but our military. But when Roy DeMeo and we understood he was a serial killer, we, not me personally, but we killed him. Right. Got rid of him. He doesn't even belong to breathe. That's it. But we're not going to fake it and say, well, you know, we'll put him away, but we won't kill him. Don't play the good guy bullshit. He's gone. He's gone. <laughs> Get rid of him and it's done. Of course, you're killing him, but you're killing him softly in a prison where you're taking away his family. You're taking Even his family would get over his death. But your family, when you're doing life, will spend 20, 30 years, children, grandchildren waiting. This is my dad or my grandfather or whatever. You're poisoning everybody with that. Right. So be true to what you are. He's done the wrong thing. You don't need 280 years in prison sentence. Death penalty. Kill him. Give him his appeal for a year, two years. He loses it, he's dead. But Sammy, using what you just said, since the end of the 1920s, the Bureau of Prisons opened up as a system in 1930. But right before that, they still had Atlanta, they had a couple of prisons before they made it into a system. Since the latter part of 1920, like 1926, 27, there have only been 50 executions 
federal executions. So think about it. If you think you're going to be executed in America, most likely you're going to be appealing it for a dozen years. Right. It's going to be a million dollars later. Right. And even if you get it, it's going to be someone like uh, a former Supermax inmate, uh, Timothy McVeigh. Mm -hmm. He got tired of the system. He deserved what he got, but he just said, you know what? I don't want to appeal. I don't want to go through this judge. Exactly. Take me home. So he got the, you know, the he's zap actually, in the arm. He's dead. He's gone. Today we have the marathon bomber there. I think he was 19 when he messed up in Boston. Boston. Um, Boston. Boston. For the marathon. And uh, you ask yourself, what do you do with a 19-year-old? He, he killed a little kid. And he killed uh, uh, hundreds of people were impacted. I think three died, but... Um, a couple hundred. A lot of well, Bottom line is all the people wounded. What do you do with that? And again, it depends on who are. If you're the victim, if you're the judge, if you're religious, if you're not really whatever. From a warden perspective, when I was asked, do you think we should put him to death? It's who? Who am I? I I'm, just, I'm the warden. Don't ask me that because it's none of my business. That's the system can decide on him. But I can tell you this: if he went away today, if they gave, gave him life, uh, the death penalty, which he does have, he's appealing it. If he does get killed, now he's 20-something years old, he'll die within minutes. Boom, you, 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 you die. So when he or, was 19 and did this, if he had a one-year appeal and he had the death penalty, you wouldn't care. It, it's, it's legit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's so not for me to say. You're talking like a man and talking like a person and a true person. But when you turn around and say, no, I, he's 19, so he can do... 60, 70 years to the super grind him away at the supermax, torture his ass. Oh, that makes you a good person? No. Well, someone asked me that question, not the family members, but someone in the publishing world up in Boston that said, What do you think? And they're going to quote me on this. I said, Well, it depends. If I was the victim, big difference. So, the bottom line, from a warden's perspective, I look at the prosecutor, I look at the victims, I look at the whole package, and the family members of the, the individual. You know, this is a young kid, he did wrong and he deserves time, but I think if you're asking what should we do, if you put him to death, he's gone in a couple seconds. If you put him at the supermax, as you say, and he's there for years and years, what is our purpose? And if you're going to do that for 60 years in prison, do we do a special thing to him? Do we say, we're going to put you on a special administrative measure and we're not going to let you have visits. We're going to torture him. We're gonna, and we're not going to call it that, but we're going to give you... Of course, we're not going to call it that. That our system hasn't analyzed this. We're so worried about the uh, Eighth Amendment and unusual punishment or whatever. We're not, because we're allowing the American Psychological Association, the courts, the whole nine yards, everyone should be looking at this and saying, in America, no matter what horrific issue you have done, do you deserve to do this, to rot away? I call it the silver... silver Steen effect because he's the number one poster boy if you will for isolation 36 years not seeing another inmate basically being locked down in various prisons that's crazy does he deserve the life in prison yes does he deserve maybe the death penalty yes he's dead now so nobody cares he died of natural causes but when he's there and he's saying by the way all I want to do is be able to play chess once in a while with another guy I want to talk to someone I want to be part of the real world. Because what are you making them? God forbid you let the guy out. Yeah. Because you get yeah, what yeah, you get. Yeah, yeah. You get what you get. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I say basically the same thing. I mean, you know, you can't say you're the good guy if you know that you're going to kill him that way to deteriorate him and his family and everything like that. And then you can come out and say, we gave him life. Forget about it. No. You can't forget about it. You could turn around and forget about my crimes and my victims. Forget about that too. Forget about everything. Good point. You can't forget about it. You're doing the same thing. And I'm not saying that he should be let out. I'm saying that if he committed horrendous, horrendous crimes and you think it's worth the death penalty, then give him the death penalty, one, maybe two years at the most to appeal. He loses his appeal. Give him the shot. He's gone and go on. Be legitimate. Be the good guy. That's being the good guy. Mm -hmm. You're helping the public and you're erasing people that do not belong. Right. So be that. Just like the other guy you mentioned his name, uh, Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh. He wanted that penalty. He wanted that penalty. Give it to Give me. Give it yeah. to me because I know what you're going to do with, you, with me. 
you know, you're going to torture me. In a way, I knew that too. When you sent me to the Supermax, I was on my second case. It was a drug case. I didn't belong there. I belonged there on my first case, the worst of the worst. Not on my second case. Yes. Yeah. And I knew you wanted to try to break me. That made me stronger. Mm -hmm. That made me stronger. It gave me the will to live and fight back. You would have been a, if you didn't have the previous convictions. Yeah. It would have been a um, what was the drug? That's, that's five years or seven you've years. You've been walking out of camp playing basketball. In a camp, right? Yeah. But I went to the U, 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 uh, ADX Supermax, and I believe it was you or somebody else, maybe the counselor, who said, "I don't think you even belong here for the crime you just committed. What did you kill somebody in prison? Of course, you're supposed to take the worst of the worst." Yeah. I said I didn't hurt a fly in prison, and on this second case, there was no murders. It was ecstasy. It wasn't even it serious was drugs. Ecstasy to me was the same bullshit as marijuana. Now, did I deserve a fucking sentence? Yeah. When they asked the judge originally, the original judge, the, the prosecutors and my lawyers, if he's found guilty or, or admits to his guilt, what do you think he would be sentenced to? The judge says, well, I'm not normally asked that kind of a question. 18 months. He <laughs> said, no, no, here's what he said. He said, but in the hallway between us, I'd probably sentence him to five years, and and, and I got a twenty not, year. Not the supermax. No, not, and not in the supermax. It would have been in a camp or something. Could I think we're kind of zeroing in on the supermax, trying to think of uh, your experience, how you reacted when you first got there, and maybe my, my first day of work, because I think it's a different observation. Right. Could be. I thought I arrived in hell. There's a you know a couple of stories that I'd like people to know. They ask me a lot of questions. And, while I got you here, I would like to know how it happened. Uh, at one point, the place seemed to be full of moths. And uh, I couldn't understand it. The place was like airtight, sealed, <laughs> impregnable. And here's a, a bunch of moths flying around. And one of them came in my cell. Mm -hmm. And it was a little strange. I was laying in bed. We had those seem like it's a uh, uh, military surplus wool blankets mm -hmm. so and um, so when i was there i think the mattress was plastic it was right. about two inches an inch right. and a half to two inches on top of cement on top of a cement block that came off all of cement a little opening on the bottom where you could keep your clothes and your commissary and uh, uh it was a plastic little pillow and I had a small little window about that big from top to top, and I could see outside into the yard. And uh, there was a row of bars, mm -hmm. and about three feet or whatever it was back, there's the door with the slot. And they called it a safe area where you could Sally walk port. in. Sally port area, yeah. Well, they call it Sally port a safe area where they could come into, and I still can't get at them, or vice versa. There's the bars. And there's a few stories about that that I'd like to discuss. But let me start with the moth. This moth landed on the blanket. And uh, I was laying down, daydreaming. I don't know what I was thinking of. And this thing started crawling up. And I put my hands like this. And he came on my hand. And it didn't seem to bother him. I didn't move. And he came up my shoulder, my arm, and then my shoulder. My neck, I felt him on my neck, and then he walked right across my face. And I, I, I was stunned. Mm -hmm. I said, I never seen that. You know, I didn't know why it didn't fly away. I put my hand like this, and he got on top of my finger. I put him back on the blanket, and he just stayed there. And, uh, you know, all this time in solitary confinement, and I found something that I could relate to. And I, it was like my little pet. Yeah. I loved this little thing. Flew around, came there, was always there. And uh, we had the shower in the, mm. in the room. You can go in, it's a little metal box. You go in, you press a button, the water starts coming out. And uh, when I would get up to take a shower, if I didn't see the moth, I would think maybe he's in there. I was afraid to put the water on because I said, to wash him out. Yeah, wash him out or we'll go through the vent or yeah. whatever. So I, I was looking there. I would see him on the wall. I'd say, okay. And I would take a shower, come out. 
stayed for quite a while. I saw a lot of them, but this particular one, it was like my buddy, mm -hmm. my little buddy, a moth. I told my daughter this once, and she said, Dad, I think in a letter, are you uh, losing your mind? <laughs> and I said, no, not, no, not really. I said, I, I, I'm in good shape. And I just like this thing. I just pay attention, looking for him, waiting for him. I would let him come on my hand. Had no fear of me whatsoever. I loved that. You were the moth man of Alcatraz. I was the moth man of Alcatraz. <laughs> that could be a good label. But, and then eventually, all of a sudden, like magic, not only him, but they were all gone. So I always wondered, how did they come in? What did they come in, stay a while, lay their eggs, and die and disappear? And then the next year or something, they come out again? Is I don't know if it's a Colorado thing, but even in my own house, I don't know how they get in, but they do. And my house is not sealed like the Supermax, but uh, it's a seasonal thing. They come out. They drive you crazy. I, I didn't play with them and stuff. When they came into my house, it's I'm trying to go to sleep, but I have the TV on or something. And one would come in there, and you can chase them around and everything else, try to catch them to, to, to do away with them almost. But I found out that it's a seasonal thing. All of Colorado, maybe other states too, they must lay eggs, and then a certain season, they just come And they out disappear. Of, yeah, yeah. So that's incredible. And uh, yeah. Well, you were going after them. I think I got a message. I think it was your wife who told she she liked a couple of those boards and protected them. I'm only yeah, kidding. Yeah. She she didn't get. But you know what you're saying there about the moth. I hope people can understand this. When you're locked down 23 hours a day, you're in this cell that you just described, and there's a moth. Now think about what you're saying. It's almost like symbolically here's some humanity coming into a cell that's not designed for humanity. Right. It's, it's, a, it's a metamorphosis almost. It's like, okay, this, the moth is no longer a caterpillar. Now it has some freedom. It's playing around. Right. And, and then you're sitting in there thinking, well, how about me? What's going on with me? You know, I'm not religious, but I guess religious people would have been blown away to think and see what I saw or you saw and so many people saw who were in there. You know, this is a message from God or whatever they thought, yeah. you know. But it, it was that kind of a feeling of something that's not supposed to be there came in. It, it, it was magical to the me. The opposite of isolation. Because yeah. isolation is what we set you up for. Right. And all of a sudden you see this something freedom. that's abnormal. It's almost like something growing through the crack at the, in the rec yard. And you see a weed coming. A weed. Is I'm looking at as a warden, type A warden I am. Where's my facility man? Spray that friggin' weed because I like cleanliness and whatever right some other inmate might look at that and say wow yeah look at the little mushroom or something growing yeah there. yeah it's 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 a weird thing i i think some people can relate to that yeah. stuff like that and uh that's the way it was and you know at one point uh my daughter wrote a letter or something and uh, and i don't know i i might have given it to this nurse or whatever i don't know how she had it and she was reading this letter mm -hmm. from my daughter, and she says, "Wow, your daughter's really a great writer." Now, this is nurse at the supermax. It is a nurse at the supermax, yeah. and she was said, "My daughter's a great writer." I don't know if I gave it. I don't know what I did, but she was reading it and stuff, and she was a good-looking woman. Very, uh, I could sense the kindness in her, mm -hmm. and uh, I loved her voice. I loved hearing her talking. And uh, then she went, I was by the bar standing listening to her. She went to give the letter back to me through the bars. I was so lonely and starving. I'll never forget her because she was kind, compassionate. Yeah. And I wanted her to stay so bad that when she went to hand the thing, uh, hand got close to the bars, and I don't know what made me do it. I reached out to grab her hand, and I, I missed a little bit, but I grabbed the hole of, I think it was her pinky, and I said, don't go. Mm -hmm. Stay for a while. I was so hungry for conversation, to talk, and she didn't pull away. She said, Sammy, I know what you're going through. 
let go of me. There's cameras all over the place. If they see this, they'll come in, they'll break your ass. Don't, don't, don't do it. I know what you're going through. And I just let go. Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't mean to hurt you. Did it hurt you? No, you didn't yeah. hurt me. I said, I just wanted you to stay a while. I understand. She says, take deep breaths. Relax. Mm -hmm. Do push-ups. Sleep. Think of good thoughts. I'll be back. You'll see me. And she left. I, I almost feel, I, I want to say that she had, her eyes were watery. Yeah. yeah. That she like, felt sorry for me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it gave me life to have that happen. And I, I'm supposed to be a tough guy. I'm not supposed to feel these things, maybe. I, I don't know. But I felt that way. Mm -hmm. Brings It chokes me up now, talking about it, how how the impact of it. that impact I still feel it I see her I feel her hand finger mm -hmm. in my hand and her voice and what she said to me so and I'm saying that because we're talking about the impact mentally psychologically on people so the moth had some sort of an impact on me for some reason some level yeah some level, she had an impact that I still remember. I don't laugh about it, I don't talk about it with people in, in a jokey way, I, she was great. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said again, I'll say it again and again, you were great, the system. There were some people who were good at it and then some people who made it a little bit easier. I used to turn around and do what they called the uh, ADX strut. So I would walk all the way to the back, even in between the, the bed and the shower in that little crack, look in the yard, come back out, walk around to the bars, back and forth, back and forth every day. Now this is not a seven by 12 foot cell. Yes, yeah. yes. And I did that and I laid down and I did some sit-ups. I did some meditation at times. And when I did meditation, I sat there and I thought, and I thought back of my mother, my father, I just good thoughts. I didn't want to get in, into an evil frame of mind and hate people or hate what was going on. I just thought good thoughts. So that helped me get it through it. Mm -hmm. She helped me get through it. The moth helped me get through it. You and your policies helped me get through it. So when people say, how the fuck did you do six and a half years in the hole? Now, I didn't do six and a half years in the hole in the ADX, per se. I was there. I was in D Ward. I was there for a while. I went through whatever he said. and, uh, and uh, But at times, the government pulled me out and brought me to different places. Um, I was indicted again while I was at the Supermax uh, for a, a crime in New Jersey, uh, a cold case, killing a cop 20 three years prior to my arrest in 2000. So 23 years before 2000 with the Iceman and uh, had a lawyer and a lawyer, a lawyer became a terrorist and that's a whole nother story and I will talk about it soon. But right now I'll get back to Bob and talking about, you know, the prison and what he did and what he, the way he sees it and stuff and it's, you know, it's a great way to relate what's what happened and about prison reform. I think Bob is for it to an extent. I am to an extent. I don't believe everybody should be let out. No, I don't believe what's going on in the country. People get arrested for fucking crimes in states. They don't even go to jail. Not even forget about the ADX. They don't go. They don't even get time. Time. They get nothing now. They get a slap on the wrist. They can go in stores and just loot the place. And uh, so, but the floor is yours. When you say that, though, it, it creates a nice, no, a nice, it creates an environment where it's so um, inhumane to begin with. Not just the supermax, but your living quarters—twenty-three hours a day, one hour in a cage to walk around—it's not too exciting. 
and something as simple as the moth or the touch of a person or the just seeing a person don't you have to touch just seeing somebody that's saying good morning or hello or if the warden goes by and says how are you doing sammy or something when you look at all that i look at the the uh, when we were there the maximum we could hold was 490 that's the maximum capacity for the supermax the worst of the worst but each person has a different way to react some people like yourself might have the tools to say let me contemplate, let me take, understand the moth issue or the someone touching. Other guys, some are, uh, we all have different toolboxes. And some of the toolboxes are, uh, I'm litigious. I'm gonna file writs every day. I'm gonna sit there all day long saying the system is bad or you know, just taking a shot at getting out paper-wise. We have uh, some guys that don't, don't have the ability to do time. They've never done time, but they did a crime that's horrific like blowing up the World Trade Center or uh, other major events in life. So you get the extreme of the Unabomber types with seven languages, PhDs, uh, authors, and all that kind of stuff. Spies, Robert Hansen, an FBI mm -hmm. spy, doing triple life there. Uh, the gang members, everyone has strength and weaknesses, but as far as doing time, it's interesting that hearing your, your story is that you were bringing in some humanity in a place that didn't have for the most part, doesn't have humanity. And each person I could tell you about, in their own little way, would say, I threw the feces, warden, when I'm not happy. I come to work and I find out some guy's been throwing feces, he's putting it all over his body. He's not, he doesn't have the skills to do time. He doesn't have the, he's not litigious. He doesn't have the uh, intellectual ability to write something up. So in some cases, it's a guy reacting doing something he normally wouldn't do in real life, but now he's at the supermax. Why did you say you're gonna slime, we call it? You're gonna slime the next staff member. One of the inmates said, the next staff member that comes here, I'm gonna slime. And he's using all kinds of profanity. I was getting ready to leave work that day, and when I heard that, I can see it on my computer at work, all the cameras, I could see that this guy saying, I'm gonna slime the next staff member. I walked down, I knew the inmate, and that's the thing, knowing each person's strength and weaknesses. I go down there, I'm trying to figure out who's the officer on duty, who's the second officer, the, the rookie on duty, and what's the issue, who's the inmate? I never had a problem with this inmate, and it's not important the name of it, but I go down there and I said, um, officers, move, move to the side. They're with the batons, they're getting ready to shoot. They're asking for permission to um, restrain, but also shoot tear gas in to, to, to stop them. That and I don't even know, I'm not getting a request from the captain, can we use tear gas? I said, well, can you tell me why he's saying this? Yeah, well, what's the, what's the issue? That's what I was always asked. Who's the inmate? Who are the staff on duty? Because sometimes there's an issue there. I go down there. I knew the inmate. I told the staff to get to the side. I'm looking through the bars because we had the sliding door open already. Right. So I'm looking at the inmate. And I said, I'll make up the name, Freddie. Freddie, are you going to slime me? And he has the hand, a handful of the crap, his urine and feces in the cup, he's going to throw it. Right. Oh, I wouldn't do that to you. I said, why not? You said, I'm the, I'm the next staff member. You're going to slime me. I wouldn't do that to you. And then I played it. I want the staff to hear it. It's on cameras. We got the goon, you know, the you know, SWAT team ready to come in. And I'm, I'm trying to go skiing. It's Friday afternoon. So I'm saying, I'm the next staff member. Are you going to slime me? No. And it's a set up a question. Why not me? Because, Warden, you always ask me about my grandmother. She, he's from Washington, uh, D.C. area. And he needs to be in prison. He did some serious stuff. And I said, I, I would never do that to you because you show me respect. You come by and you ask me about my grandmother. I show you pictures. And I'll, he'll never see his grandmother again. He, she can't afford. She's up in age. He goes, that's all I have left. But you always ask me about it. I want my new staff member to hear that. I want my old staff member, who's not maybe with the program, to hear that. And I want the camera to hear it, frankly. So I said to him, can I ask a question here? Does any one of the three of you, two officers and the inmate, what's the problem? I want to go home. That's how I talked to the guy. I want to go home. I want to go skiing. What is your problem? Every time I ask, Warren, every time I ask about my eyeglasses, they say, hey, you're an inmate. What, don't worry about it. You get new ones when we give them to you. Now, I don't know if that's true. I wasn't there. Right. And I'm trying to play on both sides. So I said, I'll tell you what. They're broken, the ones he had, he can hardly have, and he's always trying to learn his, his math. He's trying to get an adult basic education certificate or something. I said, so let me do this. I will check with Butner, 
That's where we make the glasses. And I will check on Monday. I'm not going to do it now, but I'm going to go do this. You're going to put the cup down and stop talking about sliming the, the staff. You're going to go get a bucket because you already messed up some of this out. You're going to go, officer, go get a bucket. We all four have a role. There's four guys working here or being here. We all have a role. My role is I'm going to take ch check on it. But your role, I said to the inmate, is to make sure I don't take that camera in the hallway and send that photo of you cursing out, talk about you're going to throw feces at staff and send that to your mother or grandmother. Now, I can never do that. I would never do that. The guy was in tears because what I'm saying is the only thing he had, he didn't have the moth. He didn't have the touch of the feeling. His grandmother. It was just his grandmother. Yep. And I can relate to that because my grandmother, to this day, I wouldn't do certain things talking to you right now. And I'm not religious, but I would think that maybe I'm disrespecting her and she's somewhere, you know. Right. But it's one of those things where each of the guys I work with and staff, we have our own way of dealing with the stress or the inhumanity or whatever. When I finally said, hey, put that away. If I get a call while I'm skiing that you're throwing feces, I'm going to okay the the actions from the staff. They're going to spray you. They're going to restrain you. I came back on Monday. He was okay. I did check on, I followed through. Called Butner. We got the glasses going. And I came back to see him, the same inmate, the next couple of days. And he knew I was a teacher in the prison. But that's the difference. You came back. He knew what you did. He knew, he knew it. you followed up. He knew you thought about him for that second. You were the only person on the planet who cared, who thought about him. Mm -hmm. Probably some of his family members, because he did vicious things, disowned him or moved away from him. So you're the only thing he Focused had left. On that. And he had his grandmother. And he got his glasses. He had a reason. He, yeah. Well, he got his, you talking about his grandmother. He had a reason. And that's prison reform from politicians to wardens to guards. That's what I'm talking about. That is prison reform. Mm -hmm. I belonged in there to, on my first bust, not my second bust. I don't think I belonged in there. I didn't do anything in prison and I knew it was carrying the worst of the worst. I knew who I was with there and I didn't do anything to deserve it. But I said, well, my own- It is now, yeah. It is what it is, so I gotta just settle in I had a bad reputation and somebody in Washington has taken it out on me. But somebody here, a butterfly, a nurse, a warden, a guard, a black guard, who turned around when the guy threw mail in my fucking face, said, I saw that, Sammy, don't do nothing. I, I'm, I'm your witness. Mm -hmm. That backed me up. So those things made me get through it for the people to say, how the fuck did you do it?